everybody and welcome to a very special top 10 board gaming video. This is the second of my three part series where I've been discussing two player games. In my first video I just did a general discussion of where I thought the industry was going and what was happening, particularly with the nature of going from a game like Tesla vs Edison or Seven Wonders into a boiled down version that is exclusively for two players. So with that, these two videos where I'm doing top 10s are first today's video going to be talking about games that are exclusive for two players and then next week I'm going to do another top 10 where I discuss my favorite games that have a versatile number of players that includes two players. So like I said today I'll be going over the exclusive games but before I get started if you haven't done so already please take a look at my Facebook and my Twitter feeds that's where I go and I post cool articles, fun contests, giveaways, all sorts of cool stuff like that so that you guys can just keep up and it's another way for you guys to talk to me as well. That said, as always, you guys know I love to hear from you. So with this, I mean, we're talking about two-player exclusive games. This is something that I've been talking to you guys about for literally years, and I would love to hear what you all have to say about it. What are your favorite exclusive games? Do you like the fact that they're exclusive? Do you wish that you could play with more different players? Or do you think the focus on the two-player mechanics is really where it's at and where these uh, types of things should stay? Please let me know anything and all things in the comments below. But with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with my number 10. At number 10, I've got a game that's a bit of a caveat because technically you can play it with more than two players, but if you read through the rules, then you'll see that it really is designed to be played uh, with two people. The game itself is Santorini. This is probably a game that you have seen on everybody's top anything list that in any way involves like favorite games or abstract games or anything along those lines. The idea in Santorini is that two people are trying to build up a little village essentially, like a Grecian architecture type village, and the idea is that somebody is trying to get onto up onto the third level, but you're able to block people, you've got different powers that you can get, and all sorts of different stuff. And I have to say, I absolutely love this game. The only reason it's at the bottom of this list is because of the fact that it's a caveated game. But it's absolutely insane. It's sort of like a modern day twist on like chess and Onitama type of thing, where you have that really good quality, um, very straightforward, but still complex, um, abstract strategy type of gaming where you're always got to be thinking several moves ahead. You've got a lot of replayability with the different god powers that allow you to do all sorts of different things or change wind conditions, all different sorts of things. And it's a lot of fun. It's a really, really great game. I'm actually very sad that I don't own it, but Santorini is my number 10. At number nine, I've got another abstract strategy game that I've actually discussed in that exact context. It is Patchwork. In Patchwork, you are trying to essentially build a quilt is the idea, but since it's an abstract game, then the theme is really kind of removed from the game itself. The idea is that you have awkwardly shaped pieces that you're trying to fit into a grid. That's pretty much what it boils down to. And again, it comes down to a lot of like spatial reasoning and planning ahead and all this kind of stuff. And the thing I really enjoy about this is you've actually got several layers to the strategy because you're trying to earn buttons, which act as money. And one of the ways to earn buttons is there are certain pieces that give you income effectively. So it's like, okay, well, do I want to go for this larger piece that's going to give me income? Or do I want to go for these smaller pieces so I can sort of fill in the gap? that I know I'm going to have trouble with later on and this kind of thing and again at the same time it's a two-player game so you're both working from the same sort of giant circular 
pool of uh, individual pieces. So it's like, well, if I don't get that, then I know for sure they're going to and blah, blah, blah. So you have all of those different decision making layers and things like that. But at the same time, it's still a very simplistic game, but it's a lot of fun. And I've, I've always had a, a good time with it and games like it where you have like Blocus and Cathedral and other things along those lines. But either way, Patchwork, good game, lower on the list because again, it's relatively simplistic and and frankly, there are just other games that I like more. But with all of that, Patrick is my number nine. At number eight, I've got a game that I was actually only relatively recently introduced to that is a lot of fun and takes place in the Victorian era. It is called Mr. Jack. And in this particular game, you have one player who is playing as Jack the Ripper, essentially. And the idea is that you've got a bunch of different suspects and one of those people you as Jack the Ripper has as your character, essentially. And the investigator's job is to try to figure out who it is. So round by round, you're essentially trying to keep people in the light as uh, as the in, as Mr. Jack, you want to keep people visible because the question at the end of the round is, is Mr. Jack visible and all this kind of stuff. So it's a process of elimination for the investigator. And as the game goes on, the lights start going out, the individual characters have different abilities. So like, for example, one of them has a lamp and so they can see somebody straight ahead of them. They don't need the street lights and all this kind of stuff. The theming for it is actually surprisingly fun. And I really, really enjoyed it. That was one of the biggest things that drew me to it. And again, it was a game that I had literally never heard of, but I had a blast the few times that I played it. Um, there's also a pocket version of it or like a travel version, something like that, that I, I've actually never played the smaller one. I've only played like the, the main full version and I just really, really enjoyed it. There's a lot of options that you have in terms of how and where you can move and um, the different abilities of the characters, uh, not to mention how they reset and all that kind of stuff. Very well streamlined, a very well designed game, and uh, like most of the ones on this particular list, relatively quick as well. Uh, Mr. Jack is my number eight. At number seven, I've got the first of a couple really, really big games on this list. It's one of my favorite games that I consider to be a war game at least, but we are not getting into that conversation again. The game itself is Star Wars Rebellion. Star Wars Rebellion hit pretty much all gamers like a truck when it first came out because it was honestly surprisingly good. The thing is, it's so big and so ridiculous, that's why I don't have it. I really want it. This is... Of, of all the ones on this list that I don't have, Rebellion is probably the one that I want the most. Uh, I love Star Wars. I love that the, uh, the way that the game is designed. Most importantly, unlike with the ones I've talked about so far, except maybe with Mr. Jack, the great thing about Rebellion is that you have very distinct play styles depending on if you're playing as the Imperials or as the Rebels. And I love seeing that in a two-player game, whether it's a two-player exclusive or a multiplayer game that just has different feels for different characters. It just it makes it feel so much more interesting and replayable because you know one time I'll play as the Rebels and then I play as the Imperials and it's like I'm playing a completely different game. But they're very, very similar. You've got tactics cards. You've got, um, you're talking about a lot of process of elimination. You've got the rebellion trying to do like sort of strategic strikes, like get in, get out type of thing. And the empire just like flexing its muscles and just trying to find the rebels type of thing, essentially. It's a 
lot of fun. It's a it's a really interesting game. It's huge. It takes a very long time to play, so it's something that you really need to commit to. But in my opinion, at least, it's well worth it if you enjoy those types of large scale combat skirmish war type games. And overall, Rebellion or Star Wars Rebellion, my number seven. six, I've got another sort of war game, and thankfully the last one on this list that I don't own. The game itself is Mage Wars. In Mage Wars, the idea is that each player has a little spell book, and within that spell book, it contains various creatures to summon, different uh, hazards, obstacles, all this kind of stuff. And the idea is you're playing on a board, which is like an arena. You've got Mage Wars Arena, I believe, is the official name of the re-release for this game. And essentially, you are just going and combating each other. Again, it's it's another type of skirmish game. The reason that I like this a little bit more than Rebellion is that I don't necessarily enjoy it more, but the theme is a lot of fun. I'm a huge fantasy person, and um, another thing that I love with Mage Wars is the fact that it's faster compared to Rebellion, and you also have some more versatility because you got a bunch of different characters, and they all have very unique spells books. So with the Necromancer, you're talking about summoning, you know, like skeletons and zombies and stuff like that. Whereas if you've got the Druid, then, you know, you're summon, summoning vines to trap your opponent, or you can summon like bears and foxes and things of that nature. So it's it's really cool in that sense because you, you've got a lot of versatility just amongst all the different options. Now that said, those are all different expansions, so you have to go and buy them, but it's really cool, and just having the physical spell book to flip through, it's just kind of a cool thing. It's a really fun thing to, to have as part of the game itself. But with all of that, Mage Wars is my number six. And number five, we've got the first game on this list that I actually own. And it's one of the games that brought along the idea for me to do this entire video series in and of itself. I talked about this particular game during my uh, little discussion video last week. It is Seven Wonders Duel. That is right, this is the sort of boiled down version of Seven Wonders that is designed exclusively for two players. Now you do still have the military aspect and, you know, it's set collection, military comparisons at the end of each round, a little bit of drafting, all of that kind of stuff, but it is designed and streamlined for two players. And I have to say that I really do enjoy it, all right? That's, I mean, that's why it's on this list. I really do like it. I'm not in the camp as so many other people in that, oh my god, this is changing the face of two-player games as we know it and this kind of thing. Now, it's a great game. It really is. But like I said, this is one of the games that set off my doing this entire video series because it's like, why did we need a two-player version of Seven Wonders? Like, yeah, two-player Seven Wonders is not great and it's not the first thing I reach for, but this is unnecessary, though I do have to admit it's a very, very good game. But that's why it's the middle of the pack, because I think it's unnecessary, but I do love it and I do really enjoy playing it. And again, like many on this list, most of the ones on this list, it's really quick and very easy to play. So, Seven Wonders Duel, my number five. And number 
four, I've got a game that people have been bugging me for years to get and try out and all this kind of stuff. Literally since I began doing these videos. Uh, the thing is that I've not been bugged about it in the context of two players, but rather with one player. However, it works very, very well with both. And it is the Lord of the Rings, the card game. This is an example of a living card game, which means that you can get new packs and expansions and cards and you can build up your decks and customize them and all this kind of stuff. Not quite the same as a collectible card game like Magic the Gathering, but close enough for the sake that I was just like, no. Nah. But I finally broke down and got it, and I gotta say, yes, this game is amazing. It really is. Uh, it's really interesting because it's a co-op scenario-driven game where you've got one or two people who are competing against the game, which is kind of cool. And the, the thing that I like about this is, again, the versatility, okay? So as a living card game, one of the things is that you essentially build your own deck. Now, with the, with the base game here, then it sort of has the pre-built decks and all that kind of stuff, and then you can get the expansions, which has you know, recommendations and all this kind of stuff. But that's one of the nice things, just like with uh, Star Wars Rebellion, is that you can make the game feel a lot differently. Um, in this case, you don't have the distinct sides. You don't have one person playing as the bad guy and one playing as the good guys type of thing, but instead it's a co-op game, so everybody is the good guys and the scenario is the bad guy type of thing. But even so, it's a lot of fun, and I had a great time with it because like, card drawing as far as randomizing in games is one of my favorite means of doing that. Like rolling dice, I've never been a huge fan of, except in like tabletop RPGs, but like card drawing, I've always been okay with for whatever reason. So I had a lot of fun with this game. I thought it was great. It captures the theme very, very well. I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan, so I really enjoyed it just in that sense. Uh, I found it to be very, very well balanced, reasonably uh, quick to play as well, which is always nice, uh, whether you're playing solo or with two people uh, but yeah just overall a great game that I had a lot of fun with Lord of the Rings the card game my number four At number three, I've got a game that has been consistently at the top of my favorite games lists. Not only with two players or strategy or anything like that, but just in general, this is one of my favorite games. It is Twilight Struggle. In this game, you are playing as either the US or the USSR during the Cold War, and the idea is that you are trying to influence the rest of the world to your side of thinking. So. I don't really consider it a war game, but some people do. Again, we're not getting into that discussion because we already did that in a previous video. Uh, for the purpose of this uh, video, it's a wonderfully strategic two-player game. Um, the thing is that it's very replayable even though nothing ever really changes. You generally have the same setup. The cards are always identical because the, you have the early, the mid, and the late war and it's always the same deck each time. It's just a matter of are you going to be able to use them all and what order do they come up in and that kind of stuff. But you always know what's out there type of thing. The thing is that there is just so much intrigue. There's so many individual gears turning during this game. It's absolutely mind-boggling and it's so much fun. There's a lot of little stuff to keep track of and to be careful of and you always want to watch out for things and reduce damage and blah 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 blah. You know, it's just there. there's a lot of really good quality strategy in this game. I love, love, love it. It's a wonderful two-player game and I've played it quite a few times now and I still want to play it more. So that's pretty much all I can say about it. Twilight Struggle, my number three. And number two, I've got a relative newcomer to games that I really enjoy, essentially, but it is one I've talked about several times on my channel. It is 
battle line. If you're interested, I actually did a review and demo on this so you can see exactly how it works. But suffice to say, during this game, you are trying to control several flags. And the way you do that is by playing down cards and trying to create poker hands. So you want to try to get straights, flushes, straight flushes, most preferably, uh, threes of a kind, things of that nature. The thing is that you've got a strategy in this that mostly involves if I play down this card here, I'm not going to have it for somewhere else. So. For example, if I have th if I have two sevens, then I'm like, okay, do I want to try to wait for a third seven so I can really get something good, or do I want to try for six, seven, eight of the same color? You know that that's the kind of thing that you have to really debate about, and it makes for it's not stressful, but it's it's a thinking game in a really good way because you got to think what are the odds that the card is still in there or my opponent still has it and this kind of thing so it, there's a lot of layers to it but it's very very fast really surprisingly easy to play and a ton of fun battle line my number two At number one, I've got a game that most of you will probably recognize and many of you will probably have played that is a great example and is often held up as a wonderful two-player game. It is Hive. I only have the base game for this. I don't have any of the expansions like the Ladybug or the uh, Mosquito or anything like that. But frankly, I don't think they're necessary. I love this game as it stands. The idea is it's sort of a chess abstract derivative type of thing where you've got individual pieces that move in very specific ways, but you just have an amalgamous board. You don't have a set shape board type of thing. And it's really interesting because like Patchwork and some of these other ones, you're looking essentially at spatial reasoning. You're trying to figure out, okay, how can this particular piece move? Where can it go? How far can it go? What's my most efficient way to go about and move around? Now, there are just a few basic rules for how you can move, but other than that, just go out and do it type of thing. Every single time I've played this, I've absolutely loved it. It's probably the fastest game on this entire list. And maybe not the easiest to learn, but certainly one of the easiest to learn. You, There's only a few different types of insects, then they have their special movement abilities, but once you know them, then it's like, okay, fine, good, easy. And then you know how to play, essentially. It's just, it's a ton of fun. I always have a blast playing this and it's it's a really really well designed game now that said i actually haven't even tried it with the expansions i don't know how they change it it could be for the better it could be for the worse i honestly don't know but uh, it's it is a great example of a two player abstract game that is a lot of fun very quick and very simple um, but very difficult to master type of thing so with all of that hive is my number one Well, everybody, that's going to be it for me today. I hope that you enjoyed this top 10 video on my favorite two-player exclusive games. Once again, this is part two of my three-part video series on two-player games. Next week, we're going to be doing the other side of the same coin, where I will be discussing my favorite, uh, my top 10 favorite games for two players that have a variable number of players allowed. So that's going to be a lot of fun as well. Hope to see you there. But as always, please let me know any and all thoughts about this video in the comments below. What do you think of my choices? What are your personal choices for two-player exclusive games? Do you like the idea? Do you not like the idea? All of that good stuff. Put anything and everything below. But with that, thank you very, very much again for watching. Hope to see you guys next week, and I will see you next time.